Hello and welcome. My name is Jackson Osborne. I'm the Preservation Outreach Coordinator for the Bluegrass Trust for Historic Preservation. Thank you for joining us for our July detour. Uh, we are currently inside our Civil War Museum at Hopemont, our house museum here. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about today's detour, please feel free to schedule a visit for us. We will be open by reservation on July 1st, Wednesday through Sunday, 1 to 3. Uh, we need 24 hours notice, so please give us a call. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here. We are featuring this month's detour with a focus on the window of the war that features the diary of Francis Peter. Here you can see the map behind us of Grass Park. And we are fortunate enough to be joined by Hope Brown and Jerry Daniels from Stonefin Sort, who are going to be taking us through Grass Park to show us what the Civil War was like during that time. Thank you, Jackson. Um, like, uh, like Jackson said, my husband and I uh, have a tour company, Stone Fences Tours, and we do a Civil War and Lexington tour. And this is just a portion of that walking tour that we do. So you can see here, this is the neighborhood of Gratz Park, and this wonderful map comes from the diary of the person that we're focusing on today, Frances Peter. Um, she was an 18-year-old girl who kept a diary from the years 1862 to 1864, and she had this sketched in here about the, the homes and the people in her neighborhood. Um, now, this is kind of unusual there uh, because she was a young girl who kept a diary about the Civil War. And there are not that many union diaries of union women, and this is the only one in Lexington that tells it from that perspective. Now, I will have to tell you that I had to fight my husband on being able to introduce Frances Peters because we both really love her. Um, I won because I'm a high school history teacher, and Frances represents the kind of girl that I love to teach. She is smart, she is observant, she's witty, she's articulate, and she's very um, politically active, as politically active as she could be at that time. And she did very much detail um, the politics of the Civil War um, that was going on around her. Now, her diary also represents a microcosm of the Civil War. This one neighborhood in Lexington highlights the relationships, tensions between Union supporters, Confederate supporters, and then there was also an African-American family, a free African-American family, the Britons who lived in this neighborhood as well. Um, now, I am going to, um, the tour will be kind of interspersed with um, parts of her diary, and so I'm going to read the very first section of her diary. This was on Sunday, January 19th, 1862, and this is how she starts her diary. We heard this morning of the arrest of a successionist. He had been taken up before the house of Mr. Viley of the city for carrying the southern mail, but it made his escape. Last night, an officer of Monday's regiment went to the house of Mrs. Morgan, which is where we're standing, a successionist, and informed her that the man was in her house and must surrender immediately. Mrs. Morgan and her daughters came out and protested that she knew nothing about the man and that he was not in her house. The officer persisted, his orders were preemptory, and that she did not give him up, she would they would have to search the premises, but said he should be sorry to be driven to that measure. A good many of the neighbors had assembled, and Mr. Callie Morgan also came out and said that he would give his word of honor. The officer intimated that the last was not to be relied on, but the neighbor said he, would, was, he ought to believe Mrs. Morgan that she was a lady and her word might be relied on. The officer again protested he could take no one's word and his information was certain. He then sent a man for reinforcement order to search the house and stationed his men so as to guard the premises as well as possible. It was not long before a man began shouting, here he is. The man had jumped out a window trying to escape and into the arms of the man standing there. The mail carrier was secured and taken out to camp. Mrs. Morgan said the man had come there for protection and she did not think it would be kind to betray him. This lady is the mother of the notorious Captain John Morgan. And as you can see, she is not shy about her opinions in this, um, and, but it is her diary. And so we're gonna really hear her voice throughout her diary entries. Now, as we said, our tour, Window to War, is based on the diary of Frances Peter. Um, this is the home in which she lived. Now, we know from her diary that she lived here with her mother and father. She has two sisters, and she has a younger brother. Um, there may have been more, but that's the only ones that she talks about in her diary. One thing we didn't mention about Frances um, is that she was an epileptic. 
and so she was confined to her home. So she spent a lot of time looking at her window at the activities that were going on at the lot in front of her, in front of her home. Um, she was educated when she was younger. She attended Sayers School, and we think maybe the epilepsy got worse as she got older because it did get to the point where she was confined to her home. Now, how she got her information to, to include in her diary is she read all the time. Um, she also got tidbits of information from her father, uh, Dr. Peter, who was at Transy Hospital, and at various times it was either in Union or Confederate hands. Uh, she also got information from her sisters who were out and about in the community and would come back and talk to her, as well as any gossip that she might have collected from the servants. Now what we're going to talk about now occurred in September of 1862. Uh, at this point, uh, the Confederates had pushed into Central Kentucky, and actually there was a battle in Richmond that they defeated Union forces and actually pushed into Lexington and had control of Lexington and actually our capital here in Kentucky, Frankfort, at the same time. So this, this diary was during that occupation. Okay. So this is from Francis's diary, and this is on Sunday, September 24th, 21st, 1862, and she writes, Last night about 11 wagons came into town on the Georgetown Road to the hospitals. We heard that some of them had wounded in them, but we cannot learn anything certain, for the rebels are always very quiet about such things and keep them as secret as possible. Paul went to the mill today and found a captain that Kirby Smith has sent to overlook things. This morning, another rebel soldier stopped at the door and had a long talk. He said he had been at Sumter in Fort Pickens and several other battles. He appeared to be a good-natured fellow and took all that was said in good sport. He admitted that they thought the Confederates were in a bad fix here. He didn't see how they would get out, and when he went away, he told Ma if the Union troops got to Lexington, he was going to come to the house. He also said he was going to come back sometime and have a long talk with my sister Jo, whom he seemed very pleased with, because she wasn't afraid to say what she thought of the rebels. Hey everyone, we're at the, our next house, the Bobby Bullock House. Uh, this house was actually owned by the Vertner family before the Civil War, and actually during the Civil War, the Union came in and used it as their headquarters. Uh, it was their headquarters all throughout the Civil War, except for two months in 1862 when the Confederates controlled Lexington and, and ran the house. Uh, one thing we want to tell you is that if this is not going to be in chronological order, what we're doing here, we're kind of going from house to house here. And uh, the first diary entry we got that pertains to this house. So our next diary entry actually occurred a couple weeks after the Confederates were pushed out of the state. And at this time, Union and Union supporters were actually having a ball and excited about, you know, victory. So. so this diary entry is from Friday, November 14th, 1862, and Francis writes, There was a huge flag suspended over the street by the headquarters this morning, one end of the ropes fastened to the roof of the headquarters and the other one to the trees in the college lot, so that now all secesh driving up our street will pass under it. This street is now called Union Row by those living on it, so there are no secesh living on it from the headquarters to the corner next to the big college lot. So our second entry here is in 1863, and this is before Morgan uh, comes in with his great raid, and it's a period when, I guess, there's not so, you know, encumbersome here, so. Mm -hmm. So this is on Friday, May 22nd, 1863. General Wilcox's hop came off last night and was universally acknowledged to have been one of the most pleasant parties given in Lexington. My sisters described the rooms as being beautifully adorned. Long curtains curtained the windows and standards of colors mixed with swords, guns, pistols, etc. were grouped as trophies on the walls. Stacks of muskets with piles of cannonball, ordnance, etc. adorned the corners of the room. The floors of which were chalked, one with a blue background, um, with a large eagle surrounded by stars on it, the other a red background with white stars and flowers everywhere. The supper room was a temporary affair. A large tent was erected on the lawn for the occasion and ornamented like the rest. A very fine band from Newport, I believe, enlivened the company with music. The supper was sumptuous. So our next stop is the Wycliffe House. Uh, the owner of this house at the time of the Civil War was Sally Wycliffe Woolley. Uh, she was the widow of Judge A.K. Woolley, who died during the 1849 cholera epidemic. Her dad actually 
let her have this house. Her dad was Old Duke Robert Wycliffe. He was the largest slave owner in Kentucky at the time. And as this diary entry would tell you, it's probably easy to decide which side she sided on. And so this is from Francis's diary. This is dated Wednesday, March 25th, 1863. She writes, our neighbor, Mr. Diggs the dentist, was at Mrs. Woolley's today. Said Mrs. W. was very much alarmed about the rebels coming such a large force. He asked her where the rebels could get such a large army from. Oh, she said, all our army from all over the Rappahannock is coming here. Then she remembered that she betrayed herself. She caught hold of the doctor's coat sleeve. I, I, I didn't mean to say I knew it certainly, she stammered. You know, I only supposed to. You mustn't think I know anything positive. I only imagine so, you see. Making it even more certain by her agitation and anxiety to remove the impression that she had made, that she did know what has escaped her to be true. So our next stop is actually the empty parking lot we're standing in. Um, there was a very famous house here during the Civil War. It was actually built in 1798 by Colonel uh, Thomas Hart, who fought in the Revolutionary War. He came through here in the, with the Transylvania Land Company and owned the whole block at one time. And it, it ch changed from him to James Bradford, who started the Kentucky Gazette, Lexington's first newspaper, and from them to John and Margaret Bruce. Uh, there were a couple of famous weddings here. Uh, Thomas Hart's daughter, Lucretia, married Henry Clay. And you can see Henry Clay's law office back behind us. And Mrs. Bruce, Margaret Bruce's daughter, Rebecca, married John Hunt Morgan. And uh, I'll look up to you. And at the time that Francis's diary was written, uh, Mrs. Bruce was living in the house that was on this spot. Now, this entry from her diary is on Monday, December 22nd, 1862, and she writes, on account of some rumor about John Morgan that he was expected to come or spend some of the spies here of the kind, General Granger surrounded the city with a perfect cordon of pickets, not only guarding the roads, but every other lot of dwelling on the edge of town where it was possible for anyone to enter. They searched the houses of Mrs. Morgan, Mrs. Curd, and old Mrs. Bruce. Nothing came of it, but today three of Morgan's men were caught and put in jail. Our next stop is here at the Hunt Morgan House, officially known as Hopemont. Uh, as Jackson told us today, they actually start tours next month, July the 1st. Uh, it's a great house to see, a lot of history inside, so please come out and check it out. Uh, it was built by John Wesley Hunt, who was actually the first millionaire west of the Alleghenies. Uh, he was the grandfather of John Hunt Morgan, but John Hunt Morgan actually did not live in this house. During the Civil War, it was actually occupied by John Wesley Hunt's daughter, Henrietta Hunt Morgan. Uh, the first two diary entries we have today actually occur as John Hunt Morgan is leading his cavalry into Kentucky in advance of the Confederate push into Kentucky. Okay. And so Francis' diary entry for Monday, July 14th, 1862, she writes, the excitement increases. General Ward has command here and martial law is stricter than ever. Mrs. Morgan and Mrs. Curd were sent out of town as the people threatened to level their houses to the ground, and Major Brock said he could no longer protect them. A regiment arrived this morning from Camp Chase, stayed here about an hour, and hearing that Morgan was within 12 miles of Frankfurt left for there, the police force from Cincinnati are here. And then this is from her diary on the next day, this is July 15, 1862. The houses of the Secesh are being pressed into service of our soldiers. The Secesh have had to stay at home for the last two days, but today, thinking martial law was over, they ventured out and about 50 were imprisoned in the courthouse yard. Under another proclamation, which declared that all persons that were not union and did, did not belong to any voluntary company or not willing to enlist in one were to be arrested. Now, our next diary entry actually is occurring one week after the, the Battle of Perryville. So the Confederates are retreating out of the state at this moment. So this is Wednesday, October 15, 1862, and Francis writes, There is a story afloat for the last few weeks back. A wounded man has been staying at Mrs. Morgan's, about whom there is a great deal of mystery. That even the, when the doctor came to dress his wound, the patient's face was covered and he never spoke, which made people think that it must be some great man. Monday night, when Mrs. Duke left, an ambulance followed her from Mrs. Morgan's, which was supposed to contain this person. But all of this may be much ado about nothing for anything that I know. 
So our next stop is the Mount Hope House. Uh, it was actually owned by Benjamin Gratz, who this lovely park is named after. Uh, he was a, Benjamin was a successful businessman, uh, hemp manufacturer, and actually great friends with Dr. Robert Peter across the park. Uh, we talk about how Grass Park is a microcosm of Kentucky during the Civil War, all the division. This house itself was a microcosm of Gratz Park. Uh, Benjamin's son, Kerry, actually fought for the Union. And his stepson, Joe Shelby, actually fought for the Confederacy and led the Iron Brigade. Both of these, both of these brothers actually, you know, met on the Battle of Wilson's Creek. So when we talk about brother versus brother, it occurred in this house. Uh, actually, Kerry did not survive that battle at Wilson's Creek. So our next diary entry actually occurs the day before Perryville. Now, you'll be able to tell from this diary entry exactly um, the bias that Frances has. Uh, she is very much shows her opinion in this piece. So this is Tuesday, October 7, 1862. This evening, several gorillas went to Mr. Gratz's and asked for hay to feed their horses. There was no one in the home but Miriam, Mrs. G's, Mr. G's oldest daughter, and the servants. She told them they had an order from John Morgan for the protection of their property, but the fellows said their horses were famished and they were already in the stable proceeding to help themselves. Miss Gratz had to surrender with the best grace that she could. Some three or four others came a short while later and made the servant tell them when supper would be ready. And at Mr. Gratz's supper hour, they came stalking in and Mr. G had to take them into the dining room and sit them down to his table. The guerrillas and Southern chivalry in general are very different from the Union soldiers. The Union soldiers will sit down anywhere you tell them and are not insulted if you bring them something to the door, but always seem thankful and say it is too good for them. But the Southerners expect to be taken to the best parlor and have everybody in the house waiting on them, no matter how dirty and slovenly they may be, and then will not even say thank you and that you didn't do enough for them. For our part, we would never let one put a foot in our house and tell them if they come and take away everything we have that they ought to expect us to feed them. Now, the site that we're on now is uh, one of those places that my husband and I again had to fight over, over who would get to talk. And when we arm wrestled, it was a tie. So we are going to share the story of the family who lived at this spot. Now, the houses behind us are called the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Three Sisters Home. These were not here, um, but the family who did live here, the Britons, were uh, a free African-American family. And so I'll let my husband tell you about the, the parents. The parents, uh, Henry Britton, was actually a carpenter by trade. Uh, his wife, Laura, was actually very educated, very intelligent, uh, considered a great musician of the time. And they had uh, three very successful... To a point. To a point, you know, offspring. Yeah. So I'm gonna talk, tell you about the two daughters. Um, the two daughters, the, um, again, their, their parents instilled uh, a love of education in them. And so both of the sisters attended Berea College. Uh, Berea was a, um, a school that did allow African-Americans to attend. And, and so they both went there. Mary uh, went uh, and once she obtained her degree at Berea, she then went to Howard University and obtained her medical degree. And then she comes back to Lexington and opens up a practice, and she is the first African American female physician in the city of Lexington. Now, uh, her sister, Julia, also went to Berea, um, graduated from there, and then they asked her to stay, and she became the first female African American teacher at Berea. Now, uh, what she does at this, after teaching for Berea, she decides that she is going to take off for Memphis. She goes there and she starts a music conservatory there. So she starts her own, um, her own music school. Um, so they, and both of these two, uh, these two ladies, women, are very active in the civil rights movement of the early 1900s and also are involved in the women's suffrage movement of the early 1900s. Tommy's story is not quite the same. Yeah, Tommy, their son, was one of the many African-American jockeys of the late 1800s, and he was one. Of the, he was very successful. I mean, if you if you know anything about the African-American jockeys from the 18, you know, after the Civil War to the early 1900s, they were dominant in the, you know, the sport of horse racing. Uh, he might might have not have achieved the success of like Isaac Murphy or Willie Sims or Jimmy Winkfield, 
Uh, but he was successful in his own right. He was known. He made a lot. He made quite a bit of money. Yes, they they made a lot of money back then. Actually, the African American jockeys. Um, and as Jim Crow laws became enacted, the white jockeys saw that they wanted to make this money too. So the African American jockeys were slowly pushed out of racing. So if they ran a race, they could be pushed, they'd be whipped as they're going or pushed over the rail. Uh, a lot of them turned to Europe and be became very successful in Europe. Some of them did not have as great an ending. Uh, Tommy was one of those. He was broke, down on his luck. He was living, living in a boarding home in Cincinnati. And like a few of his other brethren, he, he committed suicide. Uh, he just couldn't get past the, the glory days um, of we had been the successful jockey making lots of, lots of money and then being pushed out of that. Uh, and so he did uh, commit suicide. Yeah, so he and actually his parents, Henry and Laura, actually buried here in Lexington at the African American Cemetery number two. So if you're in Lexington, that's a cool place to check out. So now we're standing in front of the Hope House or as a lot of people know was the house that turned us back on Grads Park. Uh, the entrance used to be oriented on this side and for the daughter's wedding the house was reoriented, reoriented to the third street side. Uh, this was at the time uh, owned by the Lancaster family. Uh, their son actually fought with John Hunt Morgan. He was in his cavalry and during the great raid of 1863 they were both captured. So this diary entry pertains to that. So this is from Friday, September 4th, 1863 in Francis Wright. Mr. Lancaster went to Chicago not very long ago to see his son who was taken with Morgan and was allowed to see him. So a few days ago, Mrs. Morgan, Mrs. Duke, and some others with Mrs. Lancaster started on a like errand. They have all returned. Mrs. Lancaster took Lizzie Skillman and Maggie Lancaster with her and was allowed to see her son chiefly, she said, through little Maggie's means. Uh, Mrs. Morgan went to Columbus and was allowed to see John through a grating, but not to speak to him. She said she wished she had not tried to see him as he was so changed she hardly knew him and that he had his hair and his beard cut close. Now we're standing in front of Morrison Hall at Transylvania University. Uh, the original Transylvania used to be actually in the park. Uh, it was moved on this side of the third street after the fire. Uh, during the Civil War, it was actually known as Union Hospital Number no. Two. So Dr. Robert Peter would have been over this hospital during the time. It was, it was used by the Union for most of the war. Uh, there was a period during Confederate occupation that they also used it. But this next diary entry that we're going to read to you, actually both Union and Confederate soldiers were in the hospital at the same time. And so this is from Francis's diary on Saturday, October 4th, 1862. Some of the Union ladies who were at hospital number two today, as usual, taking things to our sick, said the Secesh begged them to give them some too. The ladies asked if the Secesh ladies didn't send things up here. No, they said they'd stop sending. So the ladies gave them what was left after the Union soldiers were fed. The Secesh ladies like very well to flirt with the officers, but they don't take any notice of the common men. Poor wretches. The Confederacy hasn't done much for them. A great many of the Secesh soldiers wear the clothes that were found at the quartermasters and the hospitals when our own men left. The Union ladies teased them everywhere they went about the Lincoln breeches and wearing the uniform of Lincoln's hirelings and would pretend sometimes to think that they were our men and ask them if they'd been paroled and when they were going to be exchanged. One day when a lady was te when, when a lady had teased one in this way, he turned to her and said, Ma'am, if you knew how much these pants cost us, you wouldn't call them Lincoln's breeches. For we didn't get them for nothing. We had to pay $5 a pair to the quartermaster, and so we have a good right to them. So we're standing in front of the McClellan House, uh, which was owned at the time by Judge Payne. Uh, Judge Payne, like everybody on the street, was a Union supporter. And the next diary entry we read is actually right after uh, John Hunt Morgan and his men were captured. So this is from her diary dated Monday, August 10th, 1863. General Burnside is in town today. The band came in from camp to escort him to his hotel and he made a short speech to the people saying among other things that he was sorry so many rebels had been allowed to vote here and that Kentucky was the most loyal state in his department. General Grant's sister was in, in town today. She was at Mrs. Judge Payne's house tonight, and Letty and Joe and some others were asked to meet her. 
they say she is a very sensible girl. Now, this next entry about this particular house is on Tuesday, January 12th, 1864. Um, General Grant was in town yesterday. He took breakfast at our neighbors, Mrs. Payne's, and my sister and Miriam Gratz were asked up to see him. So Judge Payne was pretty influential to mm -hmm. get these people to get Jason. General Grant to come here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now we're standing in front of the Anderson house behind us. Uh, it was the home of H.T. Duncan, who would become mayor of Lexington. Uh, he was a union supporter. Uh, but this was actually the, the diary entry we're going to read you. It was actually, sadly, the last entry that uh, Frances wrote. And so this is from her diary on Monday, May 4th, 1864. And she writes, Mrs. Duncan's house was discovered to be on fire this a.m. between 9 and 10. Paul and Mr. Grants ran up the, the first alarm and the crowd soon collected. The fire engine soon arrived and filled at the cistern by Mrs. Morgan's, but the hose was too short, and by the time the other hose arrived, the roof was burned off. The fire was soon put out when the engine began. The furniture was all saved, but Mrs. Duncan, Mrs. Duncan thought the roof caught fire from the chimney, but the general opinion among the neighbors is that it had been set, set fire to. There had been several fires lately. So now we're standing in the middle of Gratz Park. This would have been what was called the camp lot uh, during the Civil War. There would have been Union soldiers, uh, Confederate soldiers that would have camped on this grounds at one time or another. Uh, there also would have been stables toward the back for their horses. And uh, this entry we're going to read you now is actually what Frances sees out her window. So this entry in her diary is from Monday, February 2nd, 1863. She writes, some snow last night and weather very cold today. It will be very hard on the soldiers if it continues as it promises to do. Um, I don't see how much worse it must be in a tin, even though it may have a stove in it. I don't see how anyone could look on our camps and think how many thousands of men have been driven from their homes by this war, suffering cold and hardship and yet have any sympathy for the rebels who have brought all of this on the country. Now, this next entry is from Sunday, September 13th, 1863. Now, I will say this is one of my favorite entries um, because you could just see how, um, you, you could just see how talented and articulate that she is in this entry. I have just been looking at a very pretty picture. I have been looking from Ma's window at the soldiers in the lot how prettily they are grouped, some standing, some sitting by their campfire, where their evening meal is cooking. If I were but artist enough, what a nice sketch in colors it would make. The soldiers in their blue uniforms, surrounded by the white tents, the blazing fire with its column, some of which is a shining rifle or two, is leaning in the carpet of blue grass, so fresh and green after the rain, in contrasting with the bare brown space around the fire. So that is our last entry, but not the end of the story. Right. So um, Frances does not survive the Civil War. Um, she dies uh, at the age of 20 in August of 1864. Um, she was 20 years old, and we said we don't really know what caused her death. We do know that she was epileptic, so we don't know if it was caused from that. Uh, but we just love the fact that we have this little piece of history that is told from the perspective of a teenage girl in Lexington, Kentucky during the Civil War. And we want to give a shout out to the guys behind the camera. We really want to thank the guys at L. Gray Photography, Photography for shooting this for us for this month. So we really appreciate it.